Um, I think, and this is probably a theme that will come up later as well, um, we have been fairly successful in reducing mortality from, from disasters, although there's still a lot to be, uh, to be done. And the, um, the recent typhoon in the Philippines is a good example of how just a bit better policy would have prevented uh, a lot of mortality. But in, in general, there is a significant reduction in, in mortality, um, except for the very extreme events. Um, so, you know, we've seen the, the, the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, and, and then, you know, even for a rich country, we've seen the Japan um, Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. Uh, but in general, the, the, the trend is for mortality to, to go down. Um, I think that the main challenge is now to manage the process of recovery better, to shift the attention from reducing the, um, the risks um, or managing the risks. I'm a bit hesitant to, word, to use the word managing. I prefer the word uh, reducing. Um, to reduce risks, but rather to not think about the, the process of recovery and how we can make recoveries more successful, more beneficial, more productive, more flourishing. Conceptually, everything is connected. Um, in practice, uh, I don't see a very close con connection between the, the issues that are concerning development and managing risk, ex ex especially the extreme risks. Households face a lot of household idiosyncratic risk uh, that we're not really thinking about in the context of this Hyogo framework for action. Um, but in, if, if you only think of these big risks, the floods, the earthquakes, and so on, um, it's not, of course it is connected to the process of development, but, but it's separate enough, I think, that we can see these two as, as two separate processes, and we, we could deal with them to a large extent separately. Of course, we, we need to incorporate Disaster, uh, um, disaster risk evaluation in the process of development because it doesn't make sense to, you know, to build a new city on a floodplain. Um, most cities have previously been on, been on floodplains because we had to have cities with access to rivers because river, rivers were the main cause of, you know, ma main venue for transportation. That's no longer the case. There's no reason to build on, on, on floodplains. So we just don't do that. Uh, or, or we shouldn't do that. Um, but, but other than those sort of very basic connections, I think that there, are, it, there is enough separation between the two fields. Okay. Um, first of all, I'm not a DRR practitioner. I'm an economist, a research academic economist. Um, in economics, it's clearly not the case that disasters are getting less attention. Disaster risk is getting less attention. Actually, it's getting a lot more attention. So I don't share, at least in my own sort of um, narrow corner of the world, it's not the case that there is a less attention and we're sort of left out of the, um, the train has left and we're left on the, on the station, um, um, you know, wondering what to do. Um, whether that, that's a concern among DRR sort of policy practitioners, I don't know, I'm not one. Um, as to the separate questions about climate change, there's clearly a lot of attention to climate change. There's clearly a lot of um, funding going to climate change issues. Um, my view is that the issue of DRR is much more important than climate change. It's only loosely related to climate change. Um, and for whatever reason, it became sexier to talk about polar bears and you know what will happen in 100 years and we'll have huge waves coming over Manhattan and so on, uh, rather than talking about you know, reducing the risk of buildings falling on people's heads um, tomorrow. 
Um, I, I, I regret that. Um, that is a state of the world. Um, but I, I don't think that DRR is closely related to climate change, except for a few unique cases. Obviously, if you live in a, in a small atoll in the South Pacific, where the tallest place in your island is two meters above sea level, you are worried about a, you know, a 40 centimeter rise in sea level in the next, you know, for your grandchildren or whatever. Because that means that the, 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 the next storm is going to just wash, wash everything from your island away. Um, but the, the, the last vast majority of the people of the planet do not live in circumstances in which climate change will pose immediate extreme risks that were not present before. Um, now, there may be changing patterns of rain and floods and, and, and droughts and so on that will, will, will cause dislocations, will cause, you know, there's a lot of worry in climate change. But to me, it's a much more immediate worry to worry about, you know, the next typhoon that hits the Philippines and, and kills another 6,000 people. And we don't know if that typhoon that hit last year is related to crime. You know, the, the fact that it was so strong and went a bit south than the usual track of typhoons, whether that has anything to do with climate change or not. Uh, whether, whether it, you know, a lot of people say it does, that's completely because of the political considerations, because we understand that climate change is where the money is. I, th I think to some extent we can't, um, we can't flee from the fact that we need to think of probabilities because if we want to, to have any policy applicability, we need to assign probabilities to various scenarios in order to know where we want to invest resources. Um, on the other hand, we need to, to understand that there's a lot of uncertainty um, around these probabilities. Um, actually, the confidence intervals are so large that we are actually grappling in complete darkness, almost, and we need to take that into account when we construct our DRR choices and, 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 and policies. And we need to understand that, yes, we know a lot about where the earthquake, the, the faults are, um, but oftentimes the earthquakes happen in faults we don't know about. Um, so actually most of the big earthquakes happen in faults we don't know about. So we need to account for the fact that we, we live in a very imperfect world in terms of our knowledge or our understanding where the risks lie. And we need to adapt our policies to that, to that reality. So we, we are at the risk of misleading ourselves but relying too much about probabilities and not, not also thinking about the confidence inter intervals around those probabilities. I think r resilience is a vague concept, but it's a very important one. Um, just to give you an example, um, in Thailand there, was, there were big floods in 2011, right? Um, so uh, just outside Bangkok, I was there recently, um, um, talked to a, a family, a household, um, and they have, um, they have a house on the waterfront, and their bigger house is a bit back from the river. The house on the waterfront is, sits on floats. So whenever the river goes up, the house goes up with it. Um, and the house in the back is on stilts. So yes, there was a big flood there, and the water you know, rose by, I think, five meters high, stayed there for two months, but caused them no problem whatsoever. The, the house on the waterfront just went up, and the house in the back had stilts, so there, there was no issue. On the other hand, they said that a lot of people, because why, and I asked them, why do you have that uh, um, um, there? Because they are experiencing floods every year. This was an unusually very large flood, but they have floods every year. So they, they, they have built that resilience into their, their household. Um, on the other hand, houses that were not usually exposed to risks, the more urban areas, 
um, were actually hit much harder because, not because they experienced more flooding, but because they didn't have the mechanisms in place, that resiliency in place to deal with the flood. Um, so I think resiliency, is, resiliency is, is, um, is very important. Actually, I'd go a step further than that. Um, Nisim Taleb, the, um, the writer, talks about anti-fragility as, as, a, as a concept that is sort of the, the antonym for fragility, right? And an anti-fragile system is one in which um, a system that is shocked becomes even stronger. So it becomes stronger by experiencing shocks. Okay? Bones in our body are like that. Bones become stronger when you are running, for example, or walking, right? That's why doctors tell us to, to take a walk. Um, so I think a lot of the resiliency that we're talking about is these, actually these anti-fragile systems. So that house in Thailand is becoming resilient because they're experiencing these continually small shocks, then they can deal with the big shocks. So in some sense, we also need to be careful not to protect ourselves too much from the small shocks, because then the big shock tends to be much more, um, much more destructive, because we haven't built up the resiliency. So if we never walk, and then suddenly we have to walk for a few miles, then we can you know, damage our bones. Um, but, but not if we walk every day, then we can walk long distances. Um, so I think that, so while anti-fragility is not exactly the most um, elegant um, fr um, term, um, if we understand resiliency within that context, I think it is a very important um, uh, concept. That depends on what's the purpose of the GAR. Uh, it's not entirely obvious to me what is the purpose of the GAR. Um, it seems to have multiple purposes, and, and uh, which may be fine, but what should be, say, be, be in the next GAR depends on which kind of goal you want to emphasize. So is it a goal for, uh, does it aim for mobilization? That is, it aim to change government's views? Does it aim to change the international DRR sort of environment? Um, is it, does it uh, aim to uh, further the research agenda? Um, uh, or, or provide sort of new blue sky ideas and for, for research and investigation? Um, or, or does it want to sort of do academic research in a sense and, and, and sort of uh, consolidate the insights from academic research into some kind of a coherent um, conclusion? So these, these various aims will lead to different um, issues. My own view, I'm an academic researcher, so I'm, I'm interested more, or let, let's put it this way, I know more about the academic research than I know about mobilizing governments. Actually, I don't know anything about mobilizing governments. So for me, if, if GAR's aim is to further the research agenda on this topic, then to me, the least investigated part, the, least, the part we know the least about is the recovery process. And how can we make recovery more successful? given the fact that there are risks and we've been thinking about those risks and the exposure and, and so on, um, and we've been thinking about that a lot, how can we now move to think about recovery and what kind of institutions and policies and frameworks we need to put in place in order for recovery at various um, um, situations, whether it's you know, a flood in Thailand, a tohoku tsunami, or a small scale, um, I don't know, heat wave in, in Saudi Arabia. I don't know. Saudi Arabia is hot enough as it is. Um, so, you know, all these contexts may mean there may be commonalities and differences among them in terms of the recovery process, but, but I think we know a lot less about the recovery. So from a researcher's perspective, what I would like GAR to push for is, is to, to, to think more about more carefully about the, the, the process of recovery. Mm -hmm. um, but I, from sort of advocacy perspective or, or, or uh, you know, 
within the context of this is coming out at the, around the same time as, as HFA2, um, then there may be completely other issues. And, and, and this idea of furthering knowledge is, is very low on the priority list uh, of, of GAR 15 because of, you know, because, of the, uh, because of the timing, the unique timing of that, that publication. I think the first priority, by far, is to save lives, um, and we, we, the international community, the world, has not been doing a good enough job of that. Although there has been improvements, um, that has not been good enough. And now I'm going to say something that people will not like, even though I like bears, polar bears. I think saving lives is much, much more important. Uh, and because of that, I think that we need to place a much higher priority on specifically that uh, within the context generally of international policy and within the context of disaster risk reduction. Um, that's what, where it should be, you know, it, to me, the most out, I, that seems to me the primary goal um, of, what we are doing.